2011, she moved to Montreal. Quebec is where she joined the well-regarded Colossus, Colossus, is that how you say it? Colossus. Colossus Comics Collective. In situ, a collection of journal comics documenting her transition to Montreal won wide acclaim in US and Canada. Her work has also frequently appeared online on Top Shelf Comics, The Rumbus, and recently The Nib, as well as many others. Her latest book, War of Streets and Houses, published by Uncivilized Books, was nominated for an Ignatz Award for Outstanding Graphic Novel in 2014. Yeah. CCS is incredibly proud to welcome Sophie Yudon. Know. Stuff. Um, and 
also in high school. So at this point, I, I was only pretty much I was writing stuff, but I wasn't really drawing comics. Um, and uh, at the end of high school is when I found Gabrielle Bell's work. Um, I'll just read it. Uh, Once I was moved in, I immediately had to go to work on an illustration due the next day. Meanwhile, Tom still had to find a room. So this is it? This is it. I took some time off my work to help him look. What do you think? There are no windows. One household invited us to brunch with them. The rules are pretty simple. No drugs. If you have a guest, take them with you. When you leave, when you don't let them hang out. And don't talk to me in the morning. Out of desperation, he called the room without windows. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, well, no, that's fine. Well, call me if she changes her mind. My illustration turned out terribly. Tom couldn't find a room he wanted. We were both in despair. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Um, I really, I was like really into these comics, and like very little actually happens. Like she's living this like super mundane life where she's like, I'm just trying to find a room in a city where I can have a desk and draw. And like, I guess something about that totally appealed to me. Just. Uh, the one that's like solitude. She has this other comic where she's talking about she gets her new room and then she's in the room and she's like, oh god, I need to go talk to my roommate about a thing, but I actually like can't leave my room. Oh, I guess I just won't confront them about that and I'll just like stay in here and draw. <laughs> um, and I think I related to that. <laughs> um, so after, let's see. After I found this, I, I have been going to the Alternative Press Expo um, in San Francisco, eight, uh, for a couple years when I was like 15, 16. Um, and when I was 17, me and a few friends um, decided to table at eight. Uh, and the tables were super cheap back then. It was like 60 bucks and we split it. And all we had was one zine. Um, but it was like my favorite weekend at the time. I'd gone for a couple of years. Um, and when I was there, I met Helen Joe, who was like a few years older than me, and she was making zines. And I was like, whoa, these are amazing. Like, her comics were awesome. Um, and so I think that that kind of like kickstarted me back into comics. But I wasn't really making comics yet. I mean, or I hadn't gotten, gotten back into it. I was still kind of like talking about how I liked comics. Um, so uh, then, so when I went to college, I started. Um, comic book library with a friend. And um, I think that's where I met Kane. Yeah. Kane is actually Kane is like my biographer for like <laughs> this particular period because also I have a really bad memory, which will come up later in this talk. Um, but uh, yeah, Kane can also correct me if I get any of this chronology wrong <laughs> for the periods where we were hanging out all the time. Um, so um, so I I started this comics library, and we basically just like got a bunch of people to donate their comics, and also like secured funding from different um, places around the campus. And I got the idea from uh, Reed College in um, Portland, Oregon. Uh, and so while I was working on it, I was in touch with the guy who was in charge of that library um, in Portland, and his name was Lee, and we, I don't know, we, we chatted, whatever, we didn't stay in touch a ton, but um, I was just like, uh, through doing this, I started meeting a lot of people, like meeting Kane and meeting other people who were interested in comics, and some of whom were making them, most of whom were like consumers, basically, like myself. Um, but after doing this, and like, Kane had already been making a comic for a while, and um, I, I was finally like, all right, I'm gonna get back into making comics. Um, and. Uh, so this is like how I was drawing around the time of when I was uh, what? 19 or something. <laughs> um, I had just, uh, I think I had just read like a bunch of Mobius, or I had just <laughs> attempted to read a bunch of Mobius. I didn't like speak French at the time, so I was like, um, uh, so my first attempt at making comics again was, I was like, I'm going to do a full color, watercolor story about, which makes us like Greek mythology and bike messengers, and uh, it takes place in San Francisco, and it's about this girl that works in a game shop, and I like worked in a game shop, and um, you know, and it's going to be the, the this, this messenger Iris, who's like, she's kind of like Hermes, but actually she's like, 
she's, she represents the rainbow also, so it's going to be this like, really subtle gay metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. So anyway, I got like seven pages into that over the course of like three months. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I did an independent study with, with somebody, and I was like, man, the comments is really hard. <laughs> um, so, um, at the same time, I was doing printmaking. That was, like, primarily what I was focusing on in my work. Um, this is, like, a five-color woodcut. Um, and uh, looking back on it, I'm like, I, I remember that I was thinking a lot about how what we write and what we draw affects how we think about things. Um, that's, that's kind of what that was representing to me or what I was thinking about at that time. Um, yeah, and, that, and, and also like still totally using comics tropes even in, in stuff where I wasn't doing comics. Um, and it was around that time when I uh, read a GP book, um, Notes for a War Story. And uh, my mind was like totally blown all over again. I was just like, this comic is like about 100 pages, but it packs like so much story in. Um, and it wasn't this sort of like narrative American tradition where, where you know, uh, those sort of like a lot of underground comics where people are saying like, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened. It was like very, it wasn't exactly filmic, because there are moments where, that, you know, he would do things like, um, when it was like a memory, he would start drawing this like sparse style on the left and like shifting in and out of all of these styles. Um, and that kind of, uh, I don't know, got me really excited about European comics. Um, and at that time I got dumped and uh, I decided I needed to get, oh I was at school at UC Santa Cruz and I was like, I need to get the hell away from Santa Cruz right now. Um, so I just kind of looked for whatever pro study abroad program didn't have a language prerequisite. Um, and France happened to be one of them. And GP is actually Italian, but I was like, um, everything gets translated to French. Maybe if I learn French, I can read lots of comics. Um, so that was kind of my, uh, my thinking towards that. Um, so I ended up signing up to go abroad for a semester to um, Paris. And, um, and when I was there, um, I ended up, through a series of funny events, um, uh, I found out about Angoulême, the festival, just before I left. Um, I, I had no idea it existed until a couple of months before I was going. Um, and then uh, I sort of, it turned out that I knew somebody who knew somebody who lived there, so that person made me a fake professional badge, and I like went down and crashed on the floor and like had this total like rock star experience of like, whoa, this is Angoulême, I don't speak any French, but I'm an American, so people are being nice to me. Like, <laughs> like I'm not like any kind of cartoonist, I have nothing to show, but they're like, oh, you're here, cool. Um, so I kind of got to like, uh, yeah, I know, hang out and uh, have fun, and, and I was also, like, got to see all of this stuff that I didn't have any idea existed, and this whole scene, which felt very different from the scene over here, even though I'd been going to show it, like, eight and stuff, it was just this, like, totally different history. Um, so that was kind of the point where I was like, okay, I gotta be serious about uh, this comics thing, like, I'm tired of being, I'm tired of being a consumer, I'm tired of hanging out around cartoonists and being, being like, yeah, I'm going to make comics one day, like, cool. Um, so I came back and I tried making some more comics. Um, I tried making comics faster and like, so, I don't know, I, I think the drawing I showed you guys earlier was like a lot better than these, but um, I, uh, I, and I also started making like autobiographical comics, um, which I had not really tried before. Um, this was about uh, when I first got to Paris. I ended up. This was the girl whose couch I stayed on in Angoulême, and she was also like a porn star. And um, I got to France, and 
uh, ended up going to this art show that she was in, but where they were also doing like photo shoots and uh, anyway, it was like felt really <laughs> weird at the time, and I was like, oh, this is like a hilarious anecdote. I will write comments about it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It was like I it was still. It was really hard. It took me a long time to do it. Um, um, after that, I. I did this comic that was like a you kind of drag yourself around the street screen like it was a map and I like made um, I made this like flash based thing where you like it was kind of kind of went out this way and you go around and whatever um, but I think I was like making things very complicated in a way that I didn't need to but. Um, it was around this time that um, Kane and I went to Stumptown and we tabled there. Um, and I, well, actually, first we did this, we did the 24 hour comic together because I was like, I'm spending so much time on these comics and I'm doing all this, like, trying to like perfect everything. And, uh, and Kane had already done the 24 hour comic, so I was like, hey, will you do this with me? And so we, like, went in a series of like seven different cafes like throughout the course of the night because um, either of us had, I, I didn't have a place where we could do it at my house and we did this comic um, and it was like super liberating uh, and I did this sort of like infinite canvas scroll thing and then I made a recording book out of it. Um, I remember like my advisor at the time, her she was like not at all interested in comics. Her only advice was like, I think you need a bigger brush. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's that's fair. Like I don't know, I don't know at all how to like I don't know how to paint at all. Um, so I went and got a bigger brush. But um, but so then Kate and I went and tabled at some time and um, and that guy, Lee Walton, who had been the uh, the, the guy who was in charge of the Reed College Comics Library um, came up to our table and I was like, hey Lee, what's up? And he was like, oh hey, not much. I like work for Top Shelf now. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And he was like, I didn't know you made comics. And I was kind of like, you know, when we were talking, I don't really think I did, but I was like, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and he saw this and he was like, um, he was like, oh, do you want to do something for the Top Shelf website like this? And I was, I was like, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> Even though I had already kind of like started going in this sort of more like open direction, um, and I'll get back to that. Um, so I took I took a little like lithography class at the end of school, and this is like the first comic that I did that I think where I think it something really clicked. And um, I'll just read it. it. Says trapped. I found myself trapped in the forest. Trapped. Didn't even have my cell phone. I feared I would never escape. Luckily, I found a computer. I checked my email, but all I had was spam, so I signed an online petition to free me from the forest. And I'm still waiting. <laughs> um, I think there's definitely some, like, Gabrielle Bell influence here, where it's, like, something kind of out of, like, out of the ordinary is happening, or something mundane is happening, or kind of, like, connecting. Um, but I think the thing, the thing that I didn't really realize at the time was that I had given myself panels, I give myself a grid essentially. Because I made this as a lithograph, it was like a, what's have it here? It's like, um, you know, one of those one sheet comics. And I was just trying to like make something that I could reproduce e easily doing lithography. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing about this is it's like, you know, it's eight panels or whatever um, in the back. Uh, so this was kind of the first time where I constrained myself to a grid. Um, and I thought it really helped. Although I maybe didn't realize at the time that that was what was making it work. Um, and around this time I also uh, read some stuff that Seth was talking about, about comics. Um, so these are two Peanuts cartoons, well, Seth doing Peanuts. Um, so you think the world is getting better? Well, if you've got so much confidence in the world's getting better, how come you hang on to that blanket? Touche. Put yeah. you know, the peanuts strip. 
I intended never to grow old, but the temple bell sounds. <laughs> As I think you might have been. Um, so Seth has this whole idea that like design plus poetry equals comics. Um, mm -hmm. He says, the words and pictures that make up the comics language are often described as prose and illustration combined. A bad metaphor. Poetry and graphic design seems more apt. Poetry for the rhythm and condensing. Graphic design because cartooning is more about moving shapes around, designing, than it is about drawing. Obviously, when creating a strip about a man walking down the street, you are drawing pictures of the man in the environment. However, you are also trying to simplify those, these drawings down into a series of more iconic graphic renderings. Um, so I think that having the panels, having the grid of, of that little comic, um, I finally sort of started to get the like poetry thing instead of trying to come up with uh, all of these like crazy layouts and you know where I had to like where I was like reinventing each page. Um, so I graduated from college and uh, got myself a very lucrative job at a comic book store. Um, but this was like the comic book store of the West Coast. Like Comic Relief was this huge, it had been there for like 23 years. It was like very kind of an amazing library. Um, and because I had done the comics library thing, that was why they hired me. I just happened to have it on my resume. Like I had just gotten a job at a cheese store and then they were like, and I gave, I was like, oh, I would never get a job at Comic Relief. You know, that's where I used to go buy those Mobius books and like, um, and anyway, they called me up and were like, um, work here. So, um, uh, so I was still like drawing a lot of comics, hanging out a lot with Kane. We were drawing a lot of comics. Um, but through working at the shop, I met a ton of cartoonists. Um, uh, I met Dylan Williams, um, who was the founder of Ram Spark Club Comics um, until he died a few years ago. Um, I met folks. Uh, from the Dirty Drawers, which was like a cartoonist drawing group in the area. Um, and through that I met Joey Sayers, who's like, she does like Mad Magazine stuff. Um, Susie Cagle, who does comics journalism. Justin Hall, who does like autobio stuff and teaches at the CCA uh, and the Fame Comics program. Um, yeah, so basically just like an amazing kind of hive for, for meeting people. Um, so, um, at that time, I was also working on my comic for Top Shelf, which was like, I had this idea that um, because that was the thing that Lee had seen, I was like, okay, I have to make something like that thing that I make. Even though I had like made this other thing, these other things, and I was like, oh, I like these other things I'm doing a lot better. I was really like, no, I gotta make this thing, I gotta make this thing. Um, so this comic was supposed to be in Santa Cruz, there was like lots of um, appropriation of like indigenous uh, accoutrement, I guess, um, and uh, and also I don't know something about this, this was like 2009, 2010, um, something about like technology at the time. I, I don't even I don't know. Um, uh, but like I wasn't getting paid or anything. I was just like. I don't know why I was so um, intent on this idea of it had to be this thing, but I think also um, like really flashy colors and all this stuff was really popular at the time, like that band management, you know, and all the like surrounding, like this was kind of the era of neon and like really hot and, and like that kind of like penetrated my head, um, but I uh, kind of hated it. Um, this comic. It was like a 40 page comic. Also, this is very uh, um, uh, So I got, um, just after this, I somehow enabled myself to be in um, Prison for Bitches, which was a anthology that Michael Forge and Ryan Sands put together. Ryan Sands um, lives in San Francisco, and I, I met him probably through Helen or something. Um, yeah, that's Kane up in the upper left, being like <laughs> characteristically skeptical of my bullshit. <laughs> um, so I'm going, Lady Gaga is so subversive. What's she subverting? Hmm. <laughs> um, 
And this was also a chronicle of this, like, we had it. We threw a birthday party for Lady Gaga, and I was in Lady Gaga cover band. Uh, whatever, so blah, blah, blah. You know, I was skeptical at first, but I really enjoyed the Lady Gaga party. But I was thinking the house is becoming less political, so maybe we should take down the political posters and put up more uh, ironic stuff. That's not what Lady Gaga wants at all. <laughs> what does she want? <laughs> <laughs> Create a lie, work every day to make it real. Anarcho goddess is the tendency to create a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what year was that? That, uh, 2010. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention that also when I was in France, I, uh, I, um, I met this girl who was like really into anarchism and like, uh, we hitchhiked around together and, um, in, so in conjunction with deciding I was going to make comics, I like went on this adventure where I was like, oh man, I'm going to write this story. This is going to be the story that I do. This is going to be my like crazy on the road, like woo, you know? Um, so I was actually struggling at this point. This was like a year or so after I had been back from Europe. And I was, I was like taking the anarchism like really seriously. Um, but also like... You know, I don't know, trying, trying to not take myself that seriously. Um, let's see. Um, oh, and uh, so this came out at like TCAP 2010, um, and also at TCAP 2010, another Seth thing happened that uh, I am going to show you guys a clip from. So this, like, really struck me at the time. And, you know, take it with a grain of salt or whatever. You know, the comic book has really, really changed since I came along. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I started reading comics. Like all kids, you know, I like superhero comics and I read the, uh, you know, stuff you bought at the newsstand. And, you know, when you're a kid and you decide to become a cartoonist, um, it's not like a decision you make as an adult for a career. It's, it's you know, it's like a childish pursuit. And, um, and I always say that, you know, you're basically, you get tricked into being a cartoonist because you spend all those years as a child and as a teen, like, perfecting this craft because you, you want to, like, draw Spider-Man or whatever. And by the time you're old enough to realize that you don't want to draw Spider-Man, there's nothing else you can do. <laughs> um, and so then you have to find something else to do with cartooning. And in the early 80s, that, uh, that's when, you know, basically the, the world of alternative comics came along. And that really was a different time than now. Um, in, in a lot of ways, it was kind of a grim scene. Um, that world of comic shops and, and trying to sell your, your, your work through that, um, that system was like a very different like, experience than what's going on in comics right now. Um, I mean, I can remember like tours around to those comic shops that were just, you know, so disheartening as you, you know, you'd sit at a table with, and a couple of a couple of people would pity you and come up to like get a book signed. I remember I was at a signing once in, uh, in Albany, New York, where the comic shop owner actually called a friend of his to come in. <laughs> but you know, you felt like you were swimming up upstream. You, you just weren't reaching the people that you know the work was aimed at, and um, it really made you doubt what the logic was of even like you know for trying to pursue this idea of, of telling adult stories in the comic book medium. It seemed kind of crazy at the time. Um, I can remember, like, there just was no sense that, you know, this was, like, going to be an acceptable idea. It was like trying to tell, like, a serious story using matchbook covers or something. People just looked at it like it was a bad idea. Um, I can remember talking to a girl once who was, uh, uh, that I was kind of pursuing, actually. And um, she was a color field painter, I remember, uh, which I didn't really know what that was then, and I'm not so sure I know now. But uh, I remember her looking at me and just saying, comic books cannot be art. It's just not possible. And, you know, at that point, it really, you know, I didn't have anything much to back it up with. <laughs> um, but things have changed. You know, the meeting really has undergone, like, um, kind of a renaissance, I guess, in the last 10 years. And there is a feeling that, I think, out in the, in the, in the mainstream world now, that comics, um, they have been accepted as, an, as a serious medium. You know, there's, it's still the early days of it. Um, 
there's still like a great vista of work to be done, but I think that it's not considered an absurd idea any longer that you could ch tell serious stories, meaningful stories, through the medium of comics. Um, I mean, I think comics are exciting because they might be the very last great visual medium that's in its infancy right now, narrative medium. And that makes it an exciting career to be, to be part of. I, you know, I, I feel thrilled that I'm still working in comics at this point. Um, I, I mean, I remember in the late 90s, things looked grim. I can remember sitting with Chester Brown. I often tell this story. We were sitting in a coffee shop together, and we were saying, like, well, this looks like the end. It was like, uh, the comic shops were closing up, and we were starting to think, like, is Toronto Quarterly going to go out of business? And we thought, what are we going to do? You know, I, we were like, I guess it's back to the Xerox shop for us. But, uh, you know, just within a year, that really turned around. I'm not, I've never really been quite sure what happened around the year 2000. But somehow, uh, the comics medium, like, it, it went from what looked like a certain dim to like, a, a sudden flowering. And, um, and that's been very gratifying, to see comics come to be legitimized in some way. Um, and so basically, all this rambling is leading up to, I just wanted to, I wanted to say something to the young cartoonists out there, the people who are starting out. <laughs> I want to say this is a different medium you're working in now than when I started out. Um, it was very underground at that point, and there was no restrictions placed on you, and you didn't have any feeling about it that you were trying to appeal to any kind of an audience. There was no audience to appeal to, and there was nothing publishers could offer you. They had no money, so why would you change anything you were doing? You just did what you did because th that was the way it was. Um, there was no compromise required in anything. But as the industry has been changing, I do have a sense now that there might be, there might actually be like a carrot out there you could reach for. And I think you have to be careful. You have to like hang on to that spirit that comics had in those days, which is the idea that, you know, you're doing this work for yourself. If the work isn't for yourself, what's the point of doing it? There's no point in producing comics that will be, um, that you will be thinking of the audience more than yourself. I really want you to remember that don't try to be comic book professionals. You're not professionals. Remember to be artists. That's the important thing. So thank you very much. So I like I take that with a grain of salt. With the, I mean, the artist in, in capitalism, late capitalism, uh, vocational, uh, you know, complicated. <laughs> um, but like at the time. After spending all this time drawing like a full color 40 page comic that I ended up hating in the end, I kind of felt like um, like maybe I was going for some imaginary car carrot, like I was trying to make this thing that I thought looked professional um, and uh, just like hating it. Um, so I think that that, listening to that like really hit home for me in a way. Um, so, so yeah, I started, I guess, trying to do stuff that was a little bit weirder, although this does not necessarily look super weird to me now. But um, uh, this was, let's see, I was living in Oakland. Um, my zip code is known for, it's insane how everybody's getting money these days. I know, high rates of freedom difficulty. God, the air up here. Um, so yeah, kind of like finally going to a grid and trying to just work within that. Um, and like trying to make short pieces. This is, there's actually a third, a third page in the But um, yeah, just being like, you know what, I don't need to work towards making some kind of graphic novel or some kind of like long form piece. I should probably just get better at doing this thing, this like comics thing. Um, this is another one that I did at uh, the Hey, yeah, already on my way. No more tall grass. Shortcut, canuck, canuck. Stupid, stupid, you never carry hidden for who knows how long in the, in the unknown field. A bike pump. Hey. So I took out all the player characters from the game. It's just empty maps now. Did you see they cut the field? Yeah, man, they might put a, one of those ghetto fields <coughs> in there since we're a food desert. Why don't they just have
have a farmer's market. I'm hungry. Chip crumbs? I'm gonna go to the store. Okay. Up, up. Get up, get up. Get up, get up. Get up, get up. Get up, get up. I could be sampling peaches right now. <laughs> um, so I made this thing, I made this other thing, and um, it was around this time also that I visited CCS um, to see if I wanted to be a student. Um, but I realized that I could not live in the wilderness anymore <laughs> at, that, at that moment. Like I had grown up in the boonies, I'd gone to school in like a forest town. Um, I was like, I need to live in a city. So, um, uh, but I decided I was kind of like, I'm gonna kind of like approximate the CCS curriculum for myself. Um, so I decided to do an internship and uh, I went up and interned for Fanographics. Um, Jack Cohen, who works there, also went to UC Santa Cruz and we knew each other just because um, I guess the thing is, it's like if you like comics and you put it out there that you like comics, very like obviously, like hey, I started a comic book library. Like who wants to hang out? <laughs> um, you just like meet all of the people. They just kind of are like, oh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jack was one of the people that I had met um, in Santa Cruz as a result of that, and uh, so I decided to go up there and intern for her, and um, that was super interesting, um, but one of the things I did while I was there is I showed uh, this comic and the last comic to Eric Reynolds, who, um, he's an editor there and he used to be a publicist, or one of the publicists, um, and uh, he kind of told me to stick to, to this, he thought this style was more professional, and I had done this one sort of later, um, but for, yeah, for some reason I wasn't, I was not so much into the like, the like clear line style anymore, I was kind of getting away from it. Um, but what he said to Jack, and which she relayed to me later, uh, was that um, he was like, yeah, her chops are pretty good, but she needs to like figure out what she actually wants to write about. And I was kind of like, oh, OK. Um, so I really took that to heart. Um, and um, while I was in Seattle, I, um, I was reading Vincent Giard's blog. He's a cartoonist from Montreal. And uh, he posted on his blog in French that they were accepting applications for a residency in Montreal. Um, and I was like, I can read this post, this like two word call for artists, like maybe I'll go to Montreal. Uh, and I, like, I loved his work and they had a studio there and I heard the rent was cheap, which was not at all the case on the West Coast and still is just is like worse now in the Bay Area. Um, so I just kind of like emailed him and sent him those last couple of things and was like, can I come to Montreal? Um, and uh, he got back to me. Um, and also Julie Delport got back to me. Um, she was also working at that studio. Um, and we corresponded a bit and she was like, yeah man, like, you should totally come out here. Um, although she would be doing a fellowship at CCS so she wouldn't actually be there. Um, but, uh, yeah, so um, also while I was in Seattle, I read Inferno by Eileen Miles, and this was kind of like my first, I had kind of like read that stuff that Seth had said, and I was like, yeah, comics, design, poetry, but like I didn't actually read poetry, you know? I was like, yeah, I read poetry in high school, like I know what poetry is. <laughs> um, and I read this book, and it was, it's like very uh, stream of consciousness, like it's, it's, it's more of a novel than a than poetry, but like it says, it's a poet's novel, so it has this sort of um, strange cadence to it, and uh, and I was like really hooked on it. Um, and so, um, in preparation for going to Montreal, I decided to do um, journal comics. Um, Gabrielle Bell had just done her like month month of, of journal comics for the first time, um, and so I was like, all right, I'm going to totally like ramp up because I'm going to be like drawing all the time so I got to get ready to draw all the time so I have to like make a <laughs> make like a, a set for myself right like a, a schedule so this was like six days into uh, drawing daily comics 
went to the queer bar, all the queers were there, dance, got crazy, I had a headache. Um, yeah, like totally mundane, I don't know, <laughs> but I like this comic. Um, it was kind of like, it's the kind of thing where like I would never have drawn a comic about that happening, that was kind of like, whatever, that's just a thing I go and do sometimes. Um, Later, when I showed the book that I would make out of these later to one of my coworkers, he was like, um, he knew I was gay or queer or whatever, but he was like, man, I didn't know you, like, he was like, I liked it. I just, I didn't expect it to be so gay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, like, yeah, when you're living it, you don't really realize that it's kind of like a genre or something, <laughs> you know? So, or like, you know, when you're a 20-something and you're making journal comics, you're like, God, this is just, this is like what everyone who ever made journal comics would ever be like. like why am I doing this? So then you're like, oh wait, maybe someone who's 40 wouldn't make these comics. <laughs> you know, like this is actually a particular moment in my life and there will be a time when I'm not making these same, all right, I hope there will be a time. <laughs> but it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I would make that now, but, um, uh, but so I started doing this and I started like, I was doing them basically daily um, and developing a habit of it. Um, and then I, I got to Montreal and I totally did the thing again where I was like, I'm going to do this long comic, it's going to be full color, it's going to have this like intense plot fiction, like uh, it's going to be this ironic thing with Tumblr and like clogs and a fashion blog. And, and, um, this was just like a a sketch of one of like one of the first pages that I was laying out. Um, and uh, God, I just like tried doing this again and like of course failed again because it just I was not good at, at like you know I didn't thumbnail, I just would like start drawing the page and and it was I was drawing it you know like tabloid size. Um, so but anyway meanwhile I was still doing these um, journal comics and um, and also, while I was in Montreal, I like stumbled upon some more poetry. So I'm going to read this one. Um, back then, I'd reached the age of 20, and I was crazy. I'd lost a country, but won a dream. As long as I had that dream, nothing else mattered. Not working, not praying, not studying in morning light alongside the romantic dogs. And the dream lived in the void of my spirit. A wooden bedroom cloaked in half-light, deep in the lungs of the tropics. And sometimes I'd retreat inside myself and visit the dream. A statue eternalized in liquid thoughts. A white worm writhing in love. A runaway love. A dream within another dream. And the nightmare telling me, you will grow up. You'll leave behind the images of pain and of the labyrinth and you'll forget. But back then, growing up would have been a crime. And here, I said, with the romantic dogs. And here I'm going to stay. Um, so this was also like a moment when I was like, wow, poetry is really good. <laughs> hey Sophie, uh, why don't we... Should um, we take a break? Yeah. Okay. So why don't we take a break until 4 and then we'll go back and finish up.
So this, I like drew this, um, I started drawing on graph paper also, which is something that like, I had gone to Comic Con and seen Gabrielle Bell talk, and she had been like, oh, I draw on graph paper, and I was like, what? Um, so I would just, um, I have these like Rhodia sketchbooks that I buy that are just like graph paper, and I just like would sit and rule it out. You know, I know that each of these boxes is like 17 by 17 mm -hmm. with like a one box margin. And that would be kind of like, I feel like it's almost like in Zen when you like do these circles, you know, like this would be my sort of like meditation of getting into like, okay, I'm gonna do one of these comics now. Like I would sit down, I would draw the boxes, and then I would sort of like be in this headspace um, to, make, to make stuff. Um, in a two big house in Berkeley, I started to vibrate. She put her hand on me. I disappeared. Um, and I was posting these um, on my blog and on Tumblr. And uh, it kind of felt like doing live journal again, like 10 years later or whatever. Um, and, uh, and it felt good. Like people were responding to this stuff. And, um, even though it's like, it's like, it feels like so vague and empty and um, it had a lot of meaning to me that I like didn't know what pe other people were reading into it, you know, it's just like so comparatively abstract. Um, uh, but it felt like kind of like talking to people um, and uh, like this is a terrible Oh, you can't really see. But this is a pic. This is an image from Julie Delport's journal uh, book, which she was working on while she was here um, as a fellow. And uh, um, she it says something like S S writes that she wants to walk in the forest or something. Yada yada. And that is her drawing like that bottom panel that I did, kind of like redrawing it in her own style. Um, and she was doing journal comics at the time, and I was doing them, and yeah, it just felt like having kind of like a, a indirect dialogue. Um, and I also think that the practice of doing it, um, doing it daily meant that I did comics um, on days when I normally wouldn't have. So this one, sick, it's really not so bad, click, click. I thought I could get up, but I can't, just can't. Um, and I think like this sort of like uh, like movement or like the vibrating images. I don't know if I've really drawn that before. Like I drew this on a day when I was like horribly sick, and I was like, uh, I guess I got to draw my journal comic. Um, and part of me is like, was I in this like fever days, and I like, started drawing in this way, and then I was like, whoa, I really enjoy drawing in this way, you know? And I don't like I don't know if I would. Discovered that um, if I if I hadn't had this sort of like regimented like draw every day, do this thing every day, um, uh, and so I was in this studio up there um, in Montreal, and um, I basically just decided to stay. Like we did this forty-eight hours thing where we made we all made comments. That's Connor Williamson, who's a fellow here uh, a couple years ago. Juan, that's me in the background. Julie looking like an angel. <laughs> 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 Julie Delport and this woman Marisu. Um, these are all like these awesome cartoons. This is so this is the studio that I worked in in Montreal until I came here. Um, but it was like not usually this hustle bustle, but it was kind of like crazy to have all of this like energy around and um, Montreal was really cheap, so I was like, you know what, I'm not going to go back to the Bay Area. I'm just going to like stay here and pay incredibly cheap rent and um, just make, com make comics like all the time. Um, so this thing came out of it. It's, uh, it's around here. There's like some copies of it. I don't know if it's in the library or if it's like sitting in the lab or whatever. <coughs> uh, but we did this like this thing where, we, where those shots are from these two days that we all spent like drawing. Uh, comics, and then by the third day, we like printed a newspaper comic. Um, and at this point, I had done I had done a second 24-hour um, comic when I worked at Comic Relief. Um, so I was pretty into this sort of like doing comics under pressure, like with time constraints thing. I think that also relates to doing like the daily comics that, that 
that stuff worked for me. Um, uh, so then I ended up putting together my first book with Colos. Um, uh, and I can talk about, I was thinking maybe I'll talk about how Colos works at the end. Um, and also maybe talk about uh, how I put together a tour, if people are interested in that. Um, but maybe I'll just finish this narrative and then talk about that later. Um, so I, uh, I took this book down to Comic Arts Brooklyn. This was like, I had been there for like a few months and I made a book. Um, and I gave a copy to Gabrielle Bell and a copy to Tom Kaczynski, who um, did Uncivilized Books. And this was before Uncivilized Books was like, uh, it was just like a, he just published zines essentially. And I knew him because I had been the buyer when I got the job at Comic Relief. I was buying the small press stuff, so I had like a very basic uh, relationship with him. But I liked his comics, he makes comics too. So I just like handed that stuff over to him and was like, okay, cool, like, enjoy, bye. <laughs> um, and um, I just kept making journal comics, getting weirder, I guess. I take you very seriously, but not nearly as seriously as you take yourself. Wait, what? what's going on? I don't know, you got weird. <laughs> um, yeah, like nothing happening. I just like, like, that, I don't know, to me, like that moment when you like say something to somebody and then you're like, Oh, uh, I don't know what I just said. <laughs> they are having a reaction, and it's like this, like blank, like uh, I don't know. Um, um, so I went, I went back home, and then came back to Montreal, and was like, all right, I'm staying here. Um, uh, on my way back in, I got um, like pulled aside by the border border people, and I was on a train, and they were like, what are you doing? Come in so soon, I had said the wrong thing. I was like, I'm just going to come and be in an artist residence. You know, I'm not getting paid. I'm going to be here for three months. And then they were like, what? <laughs> um, and I was pretty intense. They like took me between the train cars and inside the train or whatever, but they were kind of like, like interrogated me. Um, and, I, and they were like, how do we know you're not going to stay? And I was like, because I'm going to run out of money. <laughs> um, which wasn't actually true. I was, well, anyway. <laughs> uh, no, I was going to run out of money. Um, but uh, when I came back, this, this um, student strike had started, um, like a tuition strike. Um, Quebec has this long tradition of students, student unions, basically, and they're like much more radicalized than pretty much anything in the States. They kind of go back to the tradition of student unit, unions in France, which is what the whole like, May 1968 stuff came out of. Um, uh, so, I didn't know that this was going to happen, um, but I came back and everybody was talking about it, and, and it was like beginning, and um, there had been like a 30% tuition increase in the UC system in California, like a couple of years before, no, like the year before, and I had kind of just been like, oh, well, I'm not a student anymore, so I guess I won't get involved in like the actions that are taking place, and, and then I was kind of like, that's kind of silly. Um, so, uh, but the guys, like a lot of people that I was in the studio with were um, relatively involved or they at very least like su supported the strike. And so we decided to make a zine. Um, this was just kind of like a flippant thing, but like we were like, we're gonna make, we're gonna publish a zine every week for the duration of the strike. Mm. Um, so we decided to make this thing font. And, uh, and the constraint, it was basically like, if you put, if you submit something to the zine, you get three copies of the zine, and that's the, and that's the extent of the, uh, I'm thinking in French, uh, tirage? Uh, of the, um, <laughs> the print one. Um, so, so, like, we were basically making this thing that was, like, totally insular, but, um, the only way you could, you were guaranteed to get a copy was if you, put stuff in it. So it's kind of this thing where it's like, oh, I wanna, I wanna like, I wanna read this, but everybody's only gonna get three copies, so like, I don't, I don't know if I'll actually be, you know, maybe they'll give one to like, their best friend and like some other person, and then I will get one. Um, so it was kind of this like, super, this really great motivator um, to keep doing little comics. Um, and it was really like, you didn't have to do barely anything. Like one of these, I have like a drawing of some plants, 
in it. And I was like, okay, I did my bit. Um, but so we started doing that. Um, and uh, so I just kind of kept doing the journal comics. Uh, all day at the book fair, went out. Manif has been on for a half hour. I'd like to go. We are too tired, too cranky, too inflexible. Where'd she go? I don't know. We are falling apart. That was the stupidest thing I've ever done. We can't find the manif, but it finds us. Um, so all this, there was a lot of like protesting and like lots of police, and lots of police hitting people, and uh, there were night walks like every night, um, these protests, and uh, so we were kind of just like trying to do comics and trying to be present for as much of the, the stuff that was going on as possible. Um, the Metro, the search X bag, in my bag, all the wrong things. Breathe, breathe, go ahead. We're waiting for a friend, not today. Today you get on the train. There was some sort of action that was supposed to take place in the Metro and we didn't actually know what it was. We just kind of were like, okay, we'll go and see what happens. Um, and that, all the wrong things originally said what I had in my bag and I was like, I don't actually, I think I should reveal that. <laughs> um, so the strike ended up, we made the zine for like nine weeks, um, but the strike actually ended up lasting for even longer than that. Um, and I have, I have a few copies of the zine that I can find that I have left here. Um, I'm gonna try to speed it up a little. Uh, yeah, this is another one of those guys. Um, one of the other things we did during the, during the zine was um, we did one issue where one person just wrote for everybody. We just had to say, okay, I want to do it. And somebody said, okay, I'm going to write uh, like a script for each person. So this says, um, sooner or later you would have learned to, to hate me. That's the first thing. Uh, but with, without you, I would never have known how to love people. Um, I've never really been there for you. No, but you were there with me, and that was enough. No one's ever really there for anyone, in any case. <laughs> when I kiss you, I feel nothing. <laughs> and we cannot love for two. Or one cannot love for two. Um, this was something where he just like gave me this text and no context, so I just kind of like made it this spy thing. <laughs> um, but it was really fun to have this like this thing where we were just like we were basically like play, you know, playing a game. It felt like um, just having these constraints and having a deadline and just like go go, you know. Um, that's just all of it. I'm only collect at the end. Uh, I also helped translate this book, Pinkerton. Um, yeah, from French. Um, anyway, around that time, um, Tom Kay from Uncivilized got contacted me and he was like, oh, I'm going to be a real publisher now. Do you want to do a book? I liked that book you gave me. And I was like, okay. So um, that's the short story of how I got published. <laughs> <laughs> I got I made a comics library, so then I got a job at a comic book store, and then I was the small press buyer, and so I got in touch with the guy who was going to be a book publisher in the future, but I didn't actually know, and then I gave him my comics, and then book deal. So, just do that. <laughs> um, no, but I think the thing is, like, I guess, like, in terms of publishing stuff, there's, there's like, obviously there's the route of, like, give your, you know, pitch to people, and that's not the route that I have gone, but, like, the thing that has, I guess, worked for me in that regard is just, like, just, I don't know, um, putting it out there that I like comics and that I make comics to whomever, um, and, like, keeping in touch with people and not, uh, yeah, I don't know, like, I never, I didn't keep in touch with Tom because I thought he was going to ever, like, get me anything. Um, I just, like, genuinely liked his comics. And it's kind of one of those things where you never know when somebody who, like, makes comics with you is going to be an editor later and then they're going to be like, hey, like, uh, do a thing, let's do a thing. So, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I 
Virginia King. Um, so, um, so after I uh, helped translate that book, I decided that it would be fun to do a little comics tour. Um, so me and the guys, uh, the French guys, well, the Beck Claw guys, we set up a comics reading tour and um, went up and up the West Coast uh, from San Francisco to Vancouver and read in places. Um, yeah, if people are interested in knowing how I did that, I will talk about that again. Um, came back to uh, Canada, and then um, after the whole, the strike had sort of died down at this point, um, but uh, having like constant interactions with police, like negative interactions with police, and also with border guards, um, I had gotten like really anxious about my status in Canada. I had been just going there as a tourist. I'd been working freelance jobs in the States. Like everything was fine, um, but I was like very paranoid that I that if I left, I wouldn't be left let back in. And you know, if I left and tried to come back in immediately, I wouldn't be let back in. And I was like having a lot of like physical anxiety from police and like where people were also police. Um, so I decided that I would do something else. So um, I was offered a little residency in France, and I decided like, oh, okay, I'll go to Europe for a few months. Um, so I went over there, and I, this was a uh, part of the 24-hour comic that I did, which I have here. Um, and that was the first time I used a brush pen, but. Uh, yeah, I guess like one of the other things is just like constantly trying to experiment with style um, or like materials. Um, I think, uh, yeah, after doing all that stuff in the full color and all that, like I just um, just wanted to try a lot of different stuff out and not and and be willing to just like uh, totally abandon one way of drawing, like at any given moment. So. Uh, so I drew this at the beginning of my stay there, um, and I drew this at like, the end of my stay. This was a little story from uh, when I first got there. Um, it's called Night Walk. He didn't need directions. He went to buy some cash. He was a chef. He met me back at the dinner place. So we even try to go back. If I want it badly enough, can I simply do it? He come from the Ivory Coast. He liked the comics. Had I read Aya? He took me to the street with the sex workers. Aya is the story of a woman from the Ivory Coast. I hadn't read it, but I knew it. Now I think, how can I not have read it? The story by a West African woman, praised, translated. He's had some girlfriends. Me too. I tell him my iPod was stolen today. I'm not complaining, just commenting. He's had a phone stolen for every year here. Five phones. We get a little lost from the kind of canal. I'm a little stoned and a little tired, but I'm proud my French is holding together. He doesn't have an apartment right now. His brother is in New York, mom is in the Ivory Coast. He laughs, he says the French don't want him here, but he and anybody else who wants to are coming from French Africa to get their fair share. He walks me to my street. Um, so this was like one of the first times when I was sort of writing about somebody else. Um, and I didn't really feel comfortable like portraying them, or I didn't want to have like I don't know. There's all these issues of gaze and representation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's G A Z. G A Z. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I said <laughs> Jake. I remember later, after this had been online for a little while, um, somebody wrote a review of it or something, and they were like, um, 
describing it, and they were like, she's in a cab, and like talking to the person driving the car, and I was like, whoa, like there's so much projection happening here. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I don't, I, well, first of all, why would a cab driver leave to go buy hash and then come back? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but also just like this really, I don't know, it's like people read into things in this way that they, like, I don't know, it's just like a really interesting assumption to me for that assumption to be made. Um, uh, yeah, so kind of my first foray into like writing about somebody else. Um, and uh, so then I started, well, I, I had been thinking for a few months about what I, before I left for France, I had been thinking about what I was going to do for Tom, and eventually I, he writes a lot about architecture and communism, because he grew up in um, communist Poland, and I was thinking a lot about like space and protest and revolution. Um, uh, so I started drawing this while I was in France. Because um, he is oppressive, I feel oppressed. Well, I keep thinking about like architecture and control. I shot out of that class, the prof was really supportive during the strike. Can't believe class is back just like that. Um, to, uh, before I came to Montreal, I read an article from some poster makers talking about the importance of poster around town. Thought nothing of it coming from a coastline which knows almost nothing but sprawl, where human scale things are quaint or unimaginable. These aren't really in exact order. Class on the 12th floor of downtown building. I've been sitting at the back to be out of the way, next to the windows. At the break, I stare out, but not for too long. I don't want to give myself away. I've never been up here. Tactical advantage. Thinking about space, abstracting in order to understand, might be one way to deal. I am trying to remove myself from the picture, but it is impossible. Um, so, Making this book, this is this is all stuff from War of Streets and Houses. Um, it was kind of like I went into it thinking I was going to write about like architecture very directly and um, kind of in this like reportage form. Um, but it ended up, up, I think, being more of me trying to work through like I don't want to say trauma, but it was very intense being like in the streets with rows of police like encircling your friends and beating their shields and throwing gas canisters at you and uh, like kind of this thing where we were all like going out every day, you know, like, all right, we're going down there, we're going down there. And then, you know, one of my friends lost the hearing in one of his ears and this other guy lost an eye and like, it was really dangerous. <laughs> um, and like, it felt weird to be in Montreal afterwards, um, kind of like this collective reeling of, um, everybody sort of thought we had won, but the, the tuition hike got halted. The, there was this party that was elected and they said, we're gonna stop the tuition, you know, we're gonna freeze tuition. And then they said, actually, once they got elected, they were like, we're going to index tuition. So it's like, it's still going to go up, and actually it would go up to a higher percentage, but it's going to go up more slowly. Um, so everybody was kind of like reeling of like, wow, we just went through this like really intense time of being out in the streets and like essentially, you know, facing down these police. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I was, a lot of it was, trying to, to process it, and that's kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, like that feeling of this like total lack of control uh, and, and kind of trying to pin it on like structural things. Um, and uh, in the end, I don't really know. <laughs> um, the, the rest of the book, is, it's sort of like an exploration of the history of urban planning and how it comes out of like certain warfare tactics and yada yada, um, but uh, I think 
it's like I did the book, it was more of like a for myself thing, I guess, in the end. It ended up being that way because it was like, kind of needed to like work through those ideas. Um, and I just, I did it in the six panel group because that was just like what I had been doing. And I think because I had developed this practice of, of doing these like journal comics, um, this is what kind of worked for me. Um, and the way that I put it together was kind of just like drawing different moments and then uh, arranging them at the end. And I, I think the book is really only, it's like 60 pages, but I have like pages and pages of other stuff that I drew that I just didn't end up including in the final time. Um, yeah. But yeah, trying to sort of construct a narrative out of these different modes, moments, um, somewhat chronological, but also interspersing in sort of theory stuff. Um, and um, since the book, I haven't done a ton of journal comics in the way that I used to. I, um, I do these comics for this quarterly magazine and um, just sort of, yeah, trying to like experiment with different forms. Um, this is one that I did here. Uh, last month. <laughs> That's like the cross log, the big co op. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and then, of course, this thing that I did. Um, and this was like. This was kind of an experiment for me because I kind of was like, all right, making journalism comics, like that's a way to make money. So it was kind of like this throwback to like, okay, I'm going to be professional now, you know? Um, and like, wow, it was a lot of work for how much money it paid. Um, but also it's like, I was originally supposed to be a five to eight page comic and it ended up being a 12 page comic. Um, and also like, this isn't the whole page, it's like, it was like four tiers and like four by four in the grid, basically. Um, uh, but it kind of like, yeah, I don't know, it brought up all these questions for me. Of, journalism is, it, the, the, the profession of journalism is so weird coming from like an academic background where like in my book I have all these footnotes and like, like I did a bibliography. Um, and journalism, it's like such a ragtag, like it feels like from the outside, I feel like it looks like this really professional kind of thing. But then when you look at the uh, sort of like professional guidelines, it's so cobbled together. Like everybody has like a different idea, you know? And it's so, it's like, I mean, academia totally like has its evolution. Maybe it's much slower than journalism in a way, and maybe that's why it seems less, um, uh, I don't know, difficult to comprehend, but um, trying to like learn how to be a journalist, I got so many different like types of feedback from people. And even though like the sort of like old journalism idea that's like you are not supposed to show uh, your work to the people you're depicting, um, of course the idea of objectivity kind of got turned on its head in like the 60s, but I feel like that is still like a, a big thing in, um, in journalism, uh, which I don't believe in at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess ultimately it, it, this was also like trying to explore a process of me trying to understand something again. Um, uh, and yeah, like confronting an issue that I really knew nothing about, but that I had like a few like tenuous connections to, um, and then trying to um, understand it. Um, but I guess it's like, yeah, when you approach something that you really know nothing about, it turns out to be a lot of work to actually <laughs> understand it. And this was like a very emotionally fraught thing, and, uh, because it was about like HIV disclosure, and I 
really didn't know anything about HIV. Like I thought I sort of did, but I like actually did not know anything. Um, yeah, so that was like it was a good it was a good experiment. But um, I don't know. I don't know if I'll do it again. Um, yeah. So. The thing I'm working on right now is, it's kind of like, I, and I wonder if this is like a good thing, but I'm, I'm trying to write the story of me and that girl in Europe being like bad kids and like learning about anarchism. And, um, and I've tried to write this for like years now and uh, and I keep failing, but it's like my my understanding of the story changes all the time. First it was about the story, then it was about my relationship with the person in the story because I had suddenly decided I was gonna do this story. My relationship with her changed. It was like, okay, now you're the person that's like the co-star of my story, so now you're like my most important friend. And then it was like, as that friendship changed, it was like, oh, well now this is about how our friendship changed and how like, that story doesn't mean this anymore. Um, and I think that like that, for me, it brings up a lot of stuff with like how building narratives, it's like we all are constantly building narratives about our life, whether we write stories or not, but um, it's interesting to try to build a narrative when you're still dealing, with, when it's still percolating in a way. Um, and I feel, at this point, I feel like I can, I can write stories when they're happening. Like I can write things that happen in the moment. Um, and I can write things once I've processed them. And I guess like the in the moment thing is like a part of that process. But there's like this weird in between place where you don't have enough distance to make yourself into a character or something. And uh, so this thing that I'm working on, I just, I just um, threw out like 60 pages or something uh, last week. So this is like how I, <laughs> this is like my thumbnails. <laughs> um, but I think that I finally have the distance with it where I'm like making myself into a character and where I'm finally also feeling like I can fictionalize some of it. Um, like I don't want to do straight memoir. And I think that that distance is kind of important for like for this story in particular where I've like put it on a, put it in this like special place for so long. Um, and I was like, it's gonna be this thing, and it's gonna have all of this like metatextual, blah blah blah. And now I'm kinda like, I'm just kind of trying to tell this story like really straight. Or like kind of humorously. I'm kind of like laughing at myself. Uh, yeah, everyone's making plans to fly around. I don't know, I thought it might be fun to hitchhike. What do you mean? You and Dad told me so many stories. This is, this is uh, that place. We have cell phones now. How could it be more dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I gotta go. Talk to you soon. Love you. Bro. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so this is like, I don't know, if people want to look at this at all, you can, but it's totally, uh, I'm basically just drawing, this is how I did my other book, where I'm just trying to draw the moments that, um, that seem important, or that, that sort of spring to mind.
questions, or I could also talk about how Colos works, um, or and also how to set up a tour, which like the second years I think have heard a lot about that. So I don't know, but I felt like people were interested in that. Then we could talk about that. How does Colos work? <laughs> how does Colos work? Okay. Um, so Colossus is like not a real uh, publisher, but it kind of like looks like it, and that's sort of important. Um, it's been around for like 10 years, and Jimmy Beaulieu started it. Um, but basically, so in Canada you can get ISBNs without like paying anything, because um, all of the companies that you go around and find it all up. Although we don't actually really use the ISBNs for anything, but they are like on all the books. Um, uh, but Colossus basically it's like Vincent and Jimmy and kind of whoever wants to. Um, uh, going up to people and being like, hey, do you want to put a book out? Um, or like people who are in the studio or whatever. But it's basically just like a collection of people where we all actually like pay for our own uh, print, printing costs, but it's under the like Colossus name. Um, and that has resulted in like lots of awesome, I mean it's been around for a long time, so it's been like sort of getting this name together, but um, but it means that like at TCAF, we get a table like next to GameQ on like the main floor, or at like Comic Arts Brooklyn or whatever. Or if I say, hey, d and bookstore, do you want to put in a Colossus order? They're like, yeah, you know, whereas with everybody else, they take consignment, you know? Um, so I guess. Is there a unified design aesthetic, or is everybody on their own for that? Um, it's like relatively unified, but, you know, like there's some fonts that we use um, often, but like some, I mean, like this. Can't see this switch. Oh! <laughs> right, right. That's, so that's the coolest website. So it also helps if somebody knows how to do web design. And this is actually set up. Um, one of the guys who, uh, David Turgeon, who's a really cool artist, he's, um, he works at a, he works for like a music, I guess it's like an online music shop and they have a tiny warehouse. So we like just like talk to the guy who runs the warehouse and put all of our like put like a, we have like a shelf of our books and like so this website runs like he just gets an email when something is purchased and he just like sends it out from that warehouse because they already like have all of the the stuff to to do it. So we actually like have our own warehouse, but I feel like you could do that with somebody else who works in a warehouse or set up your own like little warehouse situation. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess it's this, it's like a similar thing with like oily or whatever, I think. Um, although I don't think the oily people like pay for their own stuff to be published, but um, it's kind of like a nice way of using different people's strengths where everybody who is who participates in it is making comics but it's like this collective model um, where some people like like Vincent helped me design my books um, or we like sat down together we're like how can we like do this thing with the paper and whatever and um, uh, yeah I guess like just having a name that like collects you together and, and that you can be like oh yeah it's a Colossus book and people will we'll know what you're talking about. It's kind of like creating your own stamp of approval. <laughs> where like whereby like associating with your friends. You know. Yeah. I can talk a little bit about the tour that that I set up.
we made we made our little tumbler, but we also made this little like press room situation. Um, so we wrote, we, we, we got in touch with like the, like different bookstores where we wanted to do stuff. And I know that like Nicole Georges talks about talking in universities and stuff, and maybe that is like totally beautiful. I mean, now I have spoken at universities, but at the, at the time I had no idea that that was like a, a means of like getting paid for talking. Um, but I would say like, if you can't get universities as well as um, comic shops, like doing it in comic shops can be pretty awesome. And also just like small bookstores. Um, like we had one uh, bookshop where, you know, we just, we were able to just sell our stuff and they didn't take any cut. They just like wanted us to, to be there. Um, so we just like got in touch, with, like we wrote, well first we wrote to the different comic shops to see if we would, if they would want us, you know, to be able to do a thing there. Um, and once we had done that, uh, we wrote up a press release um, with just like this basic information. And if, if, if you go to this website, to this URL, it has like all of this, you know, it's basically a template for like how to do this if you want to do it. Maybe a little like, my name at the like Kowal's email address, yeah, fancy, and then just like had all these high res images of our stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, like we ended up getting a decent amount of press. Like we got, we did an Inksteads interview. We got, you know, we were like in these interviews and stuff, and like. The trick to that is just sending your stuff to them far enough in advance. Like once you have a press release, um, finding out what local papers are, sending your stuff out. It's basically like touring as like a, a band, but um, but there's the thing about touring as a band is there's more of a community of people that like go out to shows and stuff. So, um, but I mean it's kind of like Seth was talking about like sometimes you're thing and like nobody shows up. Like, our tour in Vancouver, we had like six or seven people, and we kind of we were like, oh, they're all the way to Vancouver. <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I feel like, yeah, if you want to check that out, that's all it's still up there. And it just has like a basic, you know, got some quotes, and this and that, specs, kind of just putting all of the information out there that someone would ever need to ask you about, but just like having it accessible. Um, I feel like as you went along uh, making comics, the more your your comics started to kind of like boil things down to a simplistic form. Uh, it seems like when your comics are firing on all cylinders and those is when you're taking things into that more abstract simplification of like figures and backgrounds and that kind of stuff. Um, what, what do you think, what is particularly appealing to you about, about the, is it like just because it's, uh, it's quicker or more immediate or do you find that, that like most of your influences are from that more abstract side of things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean aesthetically these days I feel like the people that I'm Still, like really excited about are like I think for a long time I didn't think about the Calvin and Hobbes and stuff you know and he's like obviously a beautiful illustrator but like in the actual panels it's like there's so little there or like Crazy Cat you know like that kind of stuff um, I think part of it was like I feel like the European comic scene is more has this more sort of like fast immediate a lot of it has you know, the alt scene has this sort of like like this mark making thing. Or um, yeah, I don't know if I'm really answering your question. <laughs> no, you are. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but. Um, looking back to the Montreal actions, do you feel like you have a calling to that sort of um, frontline experience in Denmark? Uh, some days, yeah. I mean, I think that I've been like 
Uh, I'm very like skeptical of activism, like different types of activism. I think that like like going back to that one where I'm like in a cave and I'm like writing writing a petition to get out of that whatever. It's like I'm skeptical of like armchair activism, but I'm also skeptical of like direct action, police confrontation, and street fighting. You know? Well, I I guess that's not what I meant to ask, but like. There's always that classic divide between the people of action and the people of thought, you know, and the how you, it's like you can't get from one to the other, or the mm -hmm. trap that they're in, yeah, the dichotomy. But is there, there, I mean, every individual has to wait to pass that, right? That dichotomy. Mm. Well, I think part of why I, part of why I started simplifying my comics was that so that I could do more action, like so that I could be in the world more. Um, and also like making like because I draw them those you know most of that stuff I draw at, like letter size and like would draw when I was out in the world and stuff so I think that I specifically wanted to have like a portable process so that I could like yeah so I wouldn't just always be in my in my house. Thanks. Yeah, that's just what I was thinking about as I was like diddling about my house today. It's like. Yeah, I was on the Montreal Plains, but it, you know, it actually kind of felt like there's kind of like a, not, not like a negative way, but there's kind of like a split between the Akhavan Cartanists, and there's like a lot of people there from Toronto, which is moved to Montreal, there's like that scene versus the Akhavan scene. Yeah, that was kind of weird because I, I, when I got to Montreal, I, I didn't realize that there was this like major divide between like anglophone and francophone. Like now I know that basically like all the francophones speak English or in Montreal anyway, pretty much. But like most of the anglophones, there's like a huge college community, and especially like, the people that were my age had maybe like just finished college or like weren't from the area and you know they would live for Montreal in Montreal for like four or five years and not learn French and um, yeah like I don't know like when I when I was in the studio I would talk to somebody like Connor Williamson and I was like oh yeah I'm in the studio with like Vincent Giard you know and he would be like oh I love that guy like oh I want to meet him and I was like well come to the studio and um, there is definitely like a, a, a sort of a divide, but I think that it's, I, I mean, Exposine is probably one of the most, like, um, one of the most bilingual festivals of like any of the festivals that exist in Montreal, so to me, Exposine is actually like very inclusive, but that's like relative to this like very weird divide, so. But yeah, I mean, it was weird feeling like I had found sort of like a back door into the like Quebec comic scene. But also because like I didn't have the baggage of Anglophone Canadians, which is like a long history of tension between Anglophone and Anglophone Canadians. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Well, I'll be here all week. <laughs>